All right, so Abigail, you grew up as a tomboy, preferring male friends, excelling at sports. Where have all the tomboys gone today? It's great to be here with all of you, first I'll just say that. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So where have all the tomboys gone? Well, they, they got redefined. Um, they, they were treated as recruits by gender ideologues, and they became queer or non-binary or trans, or at least that's what they were told, and that's how they came to self-define. And of course, the problem with that is that it pushes them down a very dangerous medical pipeline. If it were just a question of redefinition or a new label, that, that would be arguably okay. And I certainly wouldn't have written a book about it. Um, but, but once a girl who is gender non-conforming, and guess what, there have always been girls who are gender non-conforming, once they get the label, the process of self-redefinition starts. And I'll just say, because the second book I wrote, Bad Therapy, is about the way a lot of kids are being shoved down the mental health pipeline to similar result, not dismemberment, but a loss of agency feeling like I can't without my ADHD medication. I can't because I have this diagnosis. It's had the same effect. And a lot of the girls, by the way, if you're good in science today, if you're good in math, a lot of them will end up with a diagnosis. Oh, I'm neurodivergent. I'm spectrum-y, a little bit on the spectrum. And once again, the problem with that is not having any, there's nothing wrong with First of all, there should be no shame in having a mental disorder of any kind. But second of all, or having a diagnosis. But the problem is that once you have a diagnosis, very often the redefinition starts and it becomes a limitation. And we're seeing this. Kids are putting them in their social media profiles the, as the most prominent thing to know about them. I am neurodivergent. Again, the problem isn't having a different way of thinking or a different um, way of processing. The, the, the problem is in the labeling and the limitation that we're handing really untold numbers of kids today. So in Irreversible Damage, you note that historically gender dysphoria showed up in 0.01% of the population manifesting in very early childhood, ages two to four, almost exclusively all boys. But in the last decade, that has changed dramatically. Not only have we witnessed a sudden shift in adolescents reporting gender dysphoria, but the sex ratio has also flipped from, also, from almost exclusively boys to girls now making up the vast majority of these cases. Why? Well, the fact that the gender ratio flipped should have been a red flag right there, right? It obviously had nothing to do with social acceptance of trans people or genuinely kids with genuine gender dysphoria, okay? If, if, if it had to do with social acceptance and the loss of stigma, we wouldn't see a flip in, in, in the sex ratio. No, it's because it was a social contagion. I wrote about this four years ago, now it seems obvious. And, and it really should have been. I, I think had doctors been more honest, and less afraid, if therapists had had more integrity, it would have been. But instead they funneled these kids who were obviously had other problems. They encouraged them in the idea that really they could be a boy. And all it takes were a, few a series of hormones and surgeries to get them there. That's what they were told. Um, uh, obviously it was never true, um, but now I'm, you know, I'm very glad about the work that you know, others have done. The CAS report came out in England, and now it's well known that these, there were not only serious risks, but there were basically no benefits, certainly no mental health benefits that were proven, and yet they were tried on thousands of American children. So we've got a question from the audience. What advice do you have for someone who is dealing with a family member who is encouraging their daughter to transition to a boy. 
So it depends who the family member is and what the relationship is. It's hard. I have a lot of advice I give if it's a parent with your own child. But I'm not a provocateur, and I'm not someone who says, go have fights with lots of people in your family. And I'll tell you something else. I believe in something called not my business, which generally means that if you're an adult and you've made a decision for yourself, it's not my business, as long as you're not hurting anyone else. I'm just a big believer in that, okay? Which is why these two books are about children, because it's different there. Now, you mentioned a, a family member with a child. Look, there's a lot of information out there right now. And am I troubled by the way that some parents are encouraged to, fra uh, to fast track their children through these treatments? Yes, they're very dangerous treatments. And the benefits are wildly overstated. But I also think it's very hard to insert yourself between parents and children. And I generally don't think that's our role. What is going on with the sharp rise in girls being admitted to the ER for self-harm with a shocking five times more 10 to 14 year olds girls admitted to the ER for self-harm in 2022 uh, than in 2029? Uh, there's been a 37% increase in teens diagnosed with clinical depression, again, with girls three times more likely to suffer this than boys. Why are girls overwhelmingly more vulnerable? So girls have always been more vulnerable to social contagions, to cutting, to anorexia, to bulimia, to gender dysphoria, to tech disorders, to all kinds of things like this because of the ways they socialize, because they tend to co-ruminate they tend to take on their friend's pain. And that is sort of the mark of a good friend as a girl. If you really share her pain, you say, oh, I hate him too. It's not enough that he mistreated you. No, I hate him too, right? And, and that's how girls take on the, the all kinds of things from the anorexia. It's why anorexia spreads so quickly among groups of girls. And Lisa Lippman found that in, within friend groups, there's a 70 times prevalence rate if the friends included tra trans-identified girls. 70 times the normal uh, pre expected prevalence rate. So um, that's why girls. Why has mental health declined so precipitously in our society? And it has since the 1950s among adolescents. We've been a, we've been in a period of basically very significant decline. And part of that, there's no question, was accelerated by social media. But the bigger problem, I think, is that we're not giving kids a good life. We're actually not giving them a healthy life. And I think there are three things that are shown that really are essential for a healthy, happy life for kids. And one is parental authority. It's one of the biggest, it's one of the sturdiest studies we have, and parenting experts lie about what that means all the time because they, they adjust it to accommodate whatever they think you should be doing. But actually, parental authority, it means saying no. It means having rules and clear expectations for behavior and punishment, yeah, when kids don't live up to it. Those kids end up the happiest, most successful, and kids who end up closest to their parents of any tested group any parenting style, we need independence. Once you have authority, you can trust your kid's judgment and give them some independence. And the third thing we know kids need is loving community. There are great studies on this. The Harvard Grant study, the longest uh, long-term study of human happiness. People who love you and you love back over a lifetime, not the person mom hired to watch you. People who really love you and you love back. It can be the idiot neighbor kid. It can be all kinds of people. That might not be what who mom would have chosen. But those bonds are so important anyway. Because kids know when it doesn't matter to the new teacher that they showed up or didn't. They know when their grandma really loves them, even if she feeds them all the wrong foods. And I think all those three things are things that are unfortunately too rare in America. We live way too far from family. 
we don't give our kids any independence, any meaningful independence, right? And we don't exercise our authority, and kids need it. And when they don't get it from mom and dad, they go looking for radical sources of authority. They're hungry for authority. How does the focus on raising awareness, say, for depression or suicide often end up boomeranging, increasing the spread of the maladies that the awareness was actually meant to remedy? This is a great question because, you know, <laughs> some of the worst ideas always have the best sales pitches. And one of them is we're just raising awareness about suicide in every school. That's all we're doing. Well. If we were actually raising awareness about mental health issues, here's how it would look. We would say to kids, anxiety is adaptive. Depression is adaptive too. So feeling anxious is a normal, healthy response to a stressful situation. And I'll tell you something else, it can be really good for you. It increases performance. It makes you look both ways before you cross the street. It helps us make good memories. It's actually really good for you. And except in the very rare case where it becomes disordered, it's great that you feel nervous before a test. It's totally normal. You're fine. That's not what we tell kids. We tell them, you have anxiety. You have a panic disorder. You have depression. That's really different. Now they're living with something they can't fix on their own. They need an expert. They need a therapist. They may need medication now. And they don't know the truth, which is that actually we are built to handle hard things. No one would be in this room, no one, if it, they didn't come from a family that could meet adversity, all kinds of deprivation and privation and hardship and overcome and form a family and be successful. That's what actual mental health awareness would look like, but that's not what we're doing. We're plastering every school with suicide prevention hotlines. We are giving regular surveys authored by the CDC that do the four things known to spread suicide contagion. Valorize the subject, present it as a means of coping, give details about the methods, and repeated mention. We do the opposite of what we would do if we wanted to actually prevent suicide in schools. We are teaching kids the world is a dark place, suicide is something kids do all the time, and you might want to do it. That's the message to kids today. In writing Irreversible Damage, uh, a lot of the parents of transgender adolescents you spoke with, as well as the young women themselves who had detransitioned, described what they had been caught up with as a cult. Fifty years ago, Ayn Rand, in her famous address to West Point's graduating class, warned, quote, observe young people's dread of independence, which readied them to be to taken over by any witch doctor or guru. In your research for both irreversible damage and bad therapy, did you see evidence of this dread of independence having grown more pervasive in today's young people. Absolutely, it was a brilliant observation. And by the way, four years later, Christopher Lash arrived at the same thing, but Ayn Rand got there first. And I think it's an amazing observation. And yes, the problem's a lot worse, and here's why. We don't just have teenage boys saying to their mothers at 17, I don't want my driver's license, driving is scary. We, are, we have that today. It's not just that. We have parents who are terrified of their kids' independence. They're terrified. They haven't raised kids who can handle independence. They've never given it to them. And then they are terrified of it. And let me tell you, as someone who is a terrified parent, I hate every time the kids, my kids leave the house. I do. I don't do it for me. I do it because when I was researching the book, I learned something. And what I learned was, as scary as it was to let my then nine-year-old daughter, and she's small, walk home from the bus when she really wanted to by herself, I learned there was another danger. And the other danger is raising a kid who can't handle herself in the world. 
who's afraid to leave my house. That creates its own dangers. This is a question I have long been curious about, Abigail. Why are these kids coming from overwhelmingly white, progressive families? Could it be they absorbed beliefs about race or the marginalized and are seeking to seeking cover and redemption under the rainbow flag? Or as you put it, quote, trans as intersectional shield. I thought that was brilliant. So. If we're talking about the trans epidemic specifically, meaning the transgender identification epidemic, the epidemic of young girls deciding they were transgender, why was it overwhelmingly white progressive families? Because they tolerated and indulged it for so long. They were the families most reluctant to exercise authority. These were brilliant families. They were loving families. They were available parents. They couldn't have wanted their kids more good things they didn't want this. They invested tons of hours into these kids that they loved more than anything, but they weren't willing to say no. And I have talked to so many parents, I've probably talked to a thousand families at this point, and every time they tell me a story of their teacher introducing gender ideology to their, to their kids, I ask them the same question, and what did you say to your daughter? And invariably, they say, I asked the teacher not to show her this. I, I brought her to, I asked you know, um, the principal to stop doing this. I, sometimes if things progress further along, they ask me for a shrink. They will do everything but tell their children what they believe. What they believe. This is the only society that doesn't know the number one role of parents is to pass our values onto our children. A surge in anxiety, depression, and self-harm among young people has coincided with the, an explosion of mental health services in schools and universities. From bad therapy, I get the impression that not only are these services not making the situation any better, they may actually be aggravating the problem. How, how so? Yes, I, I think they are. They're fairly clearly making the problem worse. You know, any institution we set up, wants to then get to work to justify its existence. And have you seen the wellness centers cropping up at universities? They're like palaces. Dukes is unbelievable. Okay, it's glass, it's gorgeous. And what they want is not fewer patients, what they want is more patients. What they want is not fewer staffs, psych staffs in schools, no, they're always justifying why they need more funding. That's part of the reason for the surveys. And what they're doing is turning an entire generation into a series of patients. And here's, there are a lot of problems with that, okay? The problems are that therapy comes with side effects. A few, and that these are extremely well studied. One of them is demoralization, feeling like I can't because I have this diagnosis. That's a side effect. To treatment dependency. I can't because I have to discuss this with my therapist first. Actually, you can, but they don't know that because we didn't tell them that. And the reason I'm talking about children here is adults can do those things. Adults have lived. They can make decisions for themselves. They know. They know, bottom line, they don't need their therapist's permission. I'll give you a quick example. I was interviewing, I was interviewed by this very well-known podcaster. He's a wonderful guy. And um, he's just a wonderful guy, so I always went, he's, he's young. And whenever I'm with a young person that, that impresses me, and he's very impressive by any standard, I asked him, tell me about your parents. And his mother, unsurprisingly, was an immigrant. And he admitted to me he was a little bit scared of her growing up. By the way, that's some of the best people I know say that. And one of the things he told me was that she died when he was in college, when he was a freshman. And he started seeing the college therapist and he, by the end of his year, and this is a very strong young man in so many ways, a really fine person, uh, he thought, I've, I love my mom, but I've, I've spent enough time talking about this. I want to move on. And that's when the therapist said to him, I think you might have PTSD from the loss. 
And he remembered thinking, he told me, I don't have PTSD. A child can't do that. That's the difference. That's why I wrote the book. Because a child can't say, I miss my mom. That's normal. It's normal bereavement, and we are built to recover from it, however painful. But PTSD, I didn't go through combat. Sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Abigail, thank you so much. I really encourage all of you to uh, go out, buy both of her books, Bad Therapy and Irreversible Damage. I can also vouch that the audio versions are excellent, um, but it's uh, very, very important, this dread of independence, this fear, pervasive fear rather than hope, and resilience among young people, uh, and hopefully uh, your books and also what we're doing at the Atlas Society to instill uh, a sense of the virtues of independence, of the virtues of reason, will help to turn this tide. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for watching. You can stay connected with all of the Atlas Society's content by hitting that subscribe button below.